Andrew Janiak is the Creed C. Black Associate Professor of Philosophy uh, at, uh, at Duke University, where he's also the director of the graduate program in the history uh, of philosophy of science, uh, history and philosophy of science and, and technology and medicine. And it's hard to imagine a better person, uh, a person better qualified to speak to us tonight and in a way accessible to a general audience on the topic of Isaac Newton, philosopher. As a historian of philosophy, Professor Janiak began his work under Michael Friedman, hoping to work on Immanuel Kant, but he quickly became immersed in all things Newton. He is author of many articles and book chapters dealing with aspects of Newton's contributions to philosophy and natural philosophy, including most recently his Interpreting Newton Critical Essays, co-edited with Eric Schließer, who is also here tonight, um, Cambridge Univers University Press, 2012. Professor Janiak's most significant publication, in my view, is his 2008 monograph, Newton as Philosopher, also with CU uh, Cambridge University Press. There, Professor Janiak sets out in the boldest and clearest terms his arguments for placing at the very heart of Newton's groundbreaking work in mathematical physics the central idea that indeed for Newton to do natural philosophy is nothing less than to, quote, discourse on God, a phrase used in the general scholium and a very strange God indeed, so intimately tied to space and time themselves that perhaps the most intelligent man alive next to Newton, namely Leibniz, fundamentally misread Newton's greatest work. For many, Newton as philosophers will come as a surprise, for fundamental to Newton's conception of God and of the role of physics in knowing God is the notion that Newton did not think that gravity operates via action at a distance. So throw away all of the high school physics you learned and perhaps even some university physics. And indeed that it is mass and not gravity that is at the heart of his matter theoretical commitments. But let me end there lest I bore you with more technical details. For those of us non-Newton experts and especially because Professor Janiak is internationally reputed as being a ridiculously nice guy, he is also the right man to ask to be tonight's agent provocateur with respect to the bold thesis that he will present us with, namely that the most famous scientist of the 18th century, namely Sir Isaac Newton, was not, even in terms of his own contemporaries, a scientist. Please join me in welcoming Professor Janiak. Thank you very much. So you gave away my punchline. Uh, all right. Oh, it is? It's in the poster. OK. Uh, thank you. I want to thank Stephen Stoblin for inviting me and for getting like the entire city to come. That's very amazing. Um, so let me just tell you something about um, the orientation of this lecture. I have to begin with a caveat. There are many famous people here who work on Newton and who were working on Newton long before I was. So I'm not sure I'll say anything that enlightens them. Um, then again, I might not say anything that enlightens anyone. But if you have never read Newton or thought a lot about Newton, you might come away with something from tonight's uh, discussion. And I'll say one other thing as an introduction before I get going. There's been lots of debates, probably a lot of you know. Can you hear me if I stand here? I, I can't really stand in one place. Yes. Oh, I'm not allowed to move. Can't pick up my audio. That might be better. OK. Um, I'll try to stand like this. There have been lots of debates about the emergence of modern science. What does it take for something to become a scientific discipline? Is it mathematics? Is it experimentation? Is it observation? Is it methodology? Is it a presupposition that you can understand nature using certain techniques, et cetera? I won't say anything specifically about that, really. But in a way, what I am going to talk about is going to intersect with those things. And I'm going to say, in a way, that people have not focused on the wrong things, but have thought that certain things are necessary and sufficient. If, if there are any philosophers in the uh, audience, it's kind of an old-fashioned way of thinking, uh, where I'm going to say they're just necessary. That is, I'm going to tell you that mathematics and experimentation and observation and data collection and rigor and objectivity, all the things you think are important to a, sci a scientific discipline, are in fact important, but they're not sufficient for something to be what we now call scientific. 
There's something else that's required, and I'm going to suggest today that that something else was missing during the life of Isaac Newton. Okay. What do I do? Thank you. So I can walk around. Keep talking. Hello? Great. Amazing. Okay. Okay. Oh, this is much better. Thank you. This is going to be loud, isn't it? So uh, we'll begin tonight's lecture. Well, actually, I don't know what is on the first slide. Oh, yes. Um, with something that's in the general scholium and is uh, a very famous comment of Newton's. He had been discussing God at, at some length in the general scholium. And then he ends by saying, well, that's enough about God. And to treat of God from phenomena certainly belongs to natural philosophy. Now, this is um, not a trivial remark because there were people who did natural philosophy who did not discuss God. Um, Hobbes, for example, or the most important early Cartesian Jacques Rouault, R-O-H-A-U-L-T, who wrote a uh, treatise on natural philosophy in 1671, would have dealt with things differently. But this was certainly Newton's firmly held view. And I'm starting with that partly because it's the 300th anniversary of the general scholium and partly just to get you beginning to think about the idea that natural philosophy, according to Newton, involved the study of God. Now, from phenomena. So the question is, how can you learn about the divine being by studying natural phenomena. Well, you might think, well, of course you can, because God, if you accept such a concept and believe in such a being, was the creator of nature. And therefore, studying nature must tell you something about God. But it's really not trivial to figure out exactly what you can learn about God from studying nature. That's just the opening moment of the lecture. We're going to come back to this issue um, in, in a few minutes. Oh, OK, that's too early. So. One reason just off the bat, that's what Americans say. I don't know if Canadians say that. Does anyone know what it means? Yes, OK. You never know. Um, one reason you might think that Newton was not a scientist is because the word scientist and maybe the concept did not exist in the 17th century or even in the 18th century. In fact, the word scientist has a fascinating origin. Does everybody already know it? I'll skip it if you do. Uh, Chris can ignore it. <laughs> So there's a uh, Cambridge philosopher called William Huell, um, who was at a meeting of the British Association for the Advancement of Science in June of 1833. And he had decided to respond to something that Samuel Taylor Coleridge said at this meeting, which might surprise you, namely that the people who are members of this new association for the advancement of science should not call themselves philosophers, because what they were doing was not really philosophy. They were doing something new. And Huell responded to this by saying, well, that's true. And he said, uh, just like the practitioners of the arts are called artists, we should call the practitioners of science scientists. He coined the term. You can look it up in the OED, uh, the world's greatest source for the English language. And the next year, 1834, in the Quarterly Review, Huell wrote a review, anonymously published, but we know it was by Huell, at which he, in which he recounted this story of the British Association meeting. And it was a review of Mary Somerville's book on the connection of the physical sciences. And so, at least by implication, the first person in the world ever to be called a scientist was Mary Somerville. If you don't know who she is, take out your phone and look it up. OK. In the old days, I would have said, go to the library and read a book. But anyway, you could do that too. But you might say, well, that doesn't really tell us very much. I mean, so they weren't called scientists. Big deal. They were doing science. They were scientists, even if nobody called them scientists. But actually, I think that um, there's more to this issue than mere semantics. So I want to tell you about that um, in a little bit more detail. Always keeping in mind Newton's idea that studying the phenomena can tell you about the divine being. Um, now, you might think that that's compatible with what scientists do. You might not, but it's something that needs to guide your interpretation of what Newton was doing um, in his own work. OK, I'm going to skip a little so that we can have plenty of time for discussions uh, later on. So 
What I'm going to do is now just give you a little sketch of an argument, as philosophers like to say, for why you should think that some key ingredient was missing in the 17th and 18th centuries, at least during Newton's lifetime. And therefore, there wasn't a scientific discipline of physics, or for that matter, chemistry or biology, at that time. And here's the ingredient. This comes from what's now a classical source. Can people read that? I have no idea. Is this impossible to read? It's small. It's an eye test. Um, I'm sorry about that. I tried to make it as big as I could. Uh, the Structure of Scientific Revolutions, Kuhn's book, originally published in the Logical Positivist Encyclopedia, as you may know, in 1962, and went into numerous editions. I think I actually will read this. Um, he's talking about the history of optics, which is one of my case studies that's going to come up in a minute. And he says something extremely interesting here. At various times, all these schools, different schools of thought in optics, made significant contributions to the body of concepts, phenomena, and techniques from which Newton drew the first nearly uniformly accepted paradigm for physical optics. You may recall, bless you, Kuhn uses the notion of a paradigm, which is rather controversial. It won't be important for my argument. Any definition of the scientist that excludes at least the more creative members of these various schools will exclude their modern successors as well. Those men were scientists. Sort of sexist language, but um, especially given what I said about Mary Somerville. And anyway, in any case, he wants to say they're part of the history of science. That's what he cares about. He wants to say studying past no, no, knowably false theories is important for understanding the practice of science today, which was a revolutionary idea, I think, in the 1960s when Kuhn first articulated it. Maybe not as much anymore. Here's the key, though. Yet anyone examining a survey of physical optics before Newton may well conclude that although the field's practitioners were scientists, the net result of all their activity was something less than science. Strange, paradoxical, how could it be? Being able to take no common body of belief for granted, each writer on physical optics felt forced to build his field anew from its foundations. That is the key to the argument, namely, no scientist is an island. The missing ingredient, I'm going to claim, in the 17th and 18th centuries during Newton's lifetime was a community of practitioners, whatever they were called, who agreed on fundamental aspects of their field, fundamental principles, fundamental aspects of methodology that they all accepted. I argue that this was missing from Newton's lifetime. And I argue that Kuhn is right. We should think of this as essential to scientific disciplines. OK, that's just a preview of um, the argument. Uh, now, I will say um, one easy cop out here would be to say that Newton was not part of a community of practitioners at all. And part of the legend of Newton, of course, is that he was a lone genius staying up late at night. There's these BBC shows and a Nova show. Some of us were in some of these things where they have you know, someone looking sort of bedraggled and he's doing experiments or something. Of course, he was interested in the tradition of alchemy. And he discovers things completely on his own. Now, clearly, there has to be some truth to this idea, or else no one would have thought of it. But in fact, for those of you who are not familiar with the 17th century traditions that are relevant for understanding Newton, he was not a lone figure. He was actually part of a community in Cambridge University, which included people like Isaac Barrow in mathematics, Henry Moore in theology and philosophy, and a, a wider network that included Robert Boyle and Robert Hooke working in experimentation, uh, Christian Huygens, forgive my bad Dutch pronunciation, um, working in the continent, and later uh, Leibniz. So he was part of a community. What I'm going to argue, however, is that that community lacked the kinds of fundamental agreement that we need to see if we're going to think of something as a scientific discipline. And without a scientific discipline, you don't have scientists, or so I claim. And that's why this is a little paradoxical, that you have scientists without science. Uh, so I'm going to go through that. OK. Now, enough previews and so on. Let me try to convince you. I chose two episodes from Newton's life. One is from the very beginning of his life, um, when he was quite young. And it involves his first publications in the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society in 1671, 1672. And that's going to involve a famous debate with Hooke 
um, that everyone who knows about Newton probably has heard about. However, I'm going to give it a slightly new interpretation. So there might be something new, even for the Newton people here, possibly. The second case study will be from near the end of Newton's career, after he had been the president of the Royal Society from some time. And it will involve a debate with Leibniz, who became sort of his arch rival. You probably know that Newton and Leibniz co-discovered the calculus. We now think um, that each made fundamental contributions to understanding the calculus. In those days, however, uh, in 1713, 1715, 1716, until Leibniz died, there was a huge dispute about the calculus, who had priority over whom, and it became rather uh, political and nasty and vitriolic. And I'm going to ignore all of that and focus on the philosophy. Okay. So let me tell you a little bit about this. Now I have to read a little bit of my text. In his new theory about light and colors, which was published in the Philosophical Transactions in 1672, Newton presented a number of now famous prism experiments in order to investigate what he calls the celebrated phenomena of colors. And you can see paintings of Newton holding up a prism probably here in, in uh, Halifax. The experiment suggested to Newton what he called a doctrine. And this was written in English, so we don't have a problem with translation. Um, that he expressed in 13 numbered propositions. Included in these propositions were the following ideas. First, the rays of light that emerge when sunlight passes through a prism exhibit various colors, such as red, blue, and violet. Second, these colors differ in what he called their degrees of refrangibility, which means that they exhibit and retain a certain index of refraction, even when they're passed through a second prism. Third, in particular, red rays are refracted the least by the prism, violet rays the most, and the other colors are intermediate. Fourth, these colors, or colorful rays, are not modifications of sunlight, according to Newton, but rather what he called original and connate properties of it. I should have put this on a slide, shouldn't I? Oh, well, sorry about that. Um, fifth, this means that although ordinary sunlight appears white or colorless to perception, it actually contains colors within it, a feature of sunlight that can be revealed only experimentally. It's not open to ordinary perception. Now, you cannot overstate the controversy that these ideas that Newton's paper generated. This is just one indication of it. David Gregory, important figure at this time, write, wrote a letter a few months later in which he said, I was exceedingly surprised with these experiments of Mr. Newton. They will cause great changes throughout all the body of natural philosophy. By all appearance, if the matter of fact be true, which I have no ground to question, I would gladly see what Mr. Hook can say against the doctrine raised upon them. And that was important because Hook, in fact, did object to this doctrine. And I'm going to say that it's the character of Hook's objection that is important for what we are um, going to talk about. Now, first and foremost, the contention that ordinary sunlight contains colors within it struck many of Newton's readers as preposterous. To an Aristotelian, it might be obvious not only that colors are features of objects in the world, but just importantly, that they are perceptible features. The notion of a hidden or invisible color that requires physical manipulation to appear to perception is rather strange. Similarly, although a mechanical philosopher would reject the basic features of the Aristotelian view, she would agree that colors are perceptible. After all, to a mechanical philosopher, the redness of a jacket is actually a sensation of redness that we have when we perceive a jacket that's characterized by little particles with sizes and shapes and motions. The idea of a hidden sensation or an imperceptible sensation makes little sense. And if colors are really nothing but sensations caused by things that have other qualities, well then, that's rather uh, strange. Okay, to make matters worse, Newton could not help but add an additional argument to his paper, one involving what he thought of as a reasonable argument, although maybe not a deductively valid one. That is, a reasonable argument on the basis of what he had uh, found with the prism, but maybe not something that was demonstrated by it. And here is Newton's additional argument. This follows the doctrine expressed in 13 propositions I was discussing before. In case you can't read it, uh, I will read it for you. 
These things being so, it can be no longer disputed whether there be colors in the dark, nor whether they be the qualities of the objects we see, classic philosophical issue going back for a long time, no, nor perhaps whether light be a body. That perhaps was crucial. Newton said to Hooke, you know, I said perhaps light is a body. I didn't say light is a body. And that's a reference to a debate that many of you will be familiar with, the question of whether light is a wave or a particle, which was very much uh, alive at this time. Hooke was a wave theorist, as was Huygens, and Newton was not. For since, here's the argument he makes. For since colors are the qualities of light, having its rays for their entire and immediate subject, how can we think those rays qualities also, unless one quality may be the subject of and sustain another? Which, in effect, is to call it substance. Classic philosophical concept known to Newton by reading people like René Descartes. We should not know bodies for substances were it not for their sensible qualities. And the principle of those being now found due to something else, we have as good reason to believe that to be a substance also. In case this is a little obscure to you, if you're not used to reading English from this period, um, I suggest you do it. It's really great fun. Um, here is what Newton is arguing. Since rays of light have colors as basic features, we should regard those colors as qualities of the rays, or properties, despite the fact that these qualities are imperceptible under ordinary circumstances. Remember, you only see the colors if you take the sunlight and pass it through a prism. You don't see it when you look at the sunlight directly. But that requires us to think of the rays of light as bearers of qualities, that is, as substances in their own right. And if rays of light are substances, this means that we cannot also think of them as qualities of any further thing. Since waves are qualities of some medium, like waves on the surface of the ocean, a nice Halifax example, this entails, Newton thinks, that what light is not wave-like. Now, he said perhaps in the original English because he didn't think this was, as it were, demonstrated by his experiments. But he added it. He clearly thought this was the right view. And of course, it became the subject of serious controversy immediately. People like Hooke, who believe that light is a wave, rejected Newton's view. But that was not all. Hooke rejected Newton's view in a very fundamental way. OK. For his part, Newton wished to make the following distinction. And this is going to be familiar to people who know about these things. And the new stuff will come in a minute. Newton's doctrine concerning the features of sunlight was well established on the basis of the prism experiments. His further inference that light is not wave-like was merely his hypothesis. That's the word that he wanted to use, a word that has forever been associated with Newton's name because in Principia Mathematica, um, in, in later editions, he said, hypotheses non fingo, uh, I feign no hypotheses, which many people take to be a very general methodological principle of Newton's, although, of course, the details are much more complex. In any case, he was using this word and thinking about the role of hypothetical reasoning in natural philosophy from the very beginning of his career. Newton thought his experimental conclusions were not to be conflated with his more speculative hypothetical inference. He wanted you to accept the doctrine about sunlight, which I described a little bit, even if you didn't accept that light is particulate rather than wave-like. Newton's readers, however, systematically re disregarded this distinction. And that's very clear. One of them, Robert Hooke, um, responded with a detailed letter to Oldenburg. In the first few sentences of this letter, Hooke argues that Newton's, quote, hypothesis of saving the phenomena of colors essentially involves the contention that rays of light are made of particles rather than waves. Hooke argues, in contrast, that light is, quote, nothing but a pulse or motion propagated through a homogeneous, uniform, transparent medium. That is, he argues that light is, in fact, wave-like. He notes, moreover, that his theory, that is, Hooke's theory, can save the phenomena of colors just as well as Newton's, which is to say his theory is compatible with Newton's experimental evidence. 
Evidently, the line of argument in the passage here caught New, uh, Hooke's eye, and he was not alone. In a letter to Huygens explaining Newton's theory of light, none other than a young Leibniz wrote that Newton takes light to be a body, a bunch of particles, propelled from the sun to the earth, which, according to Leibniz, Newton took to explain the phenomena of colors and the business about refraction. This debate, I argue, represents a rock-bottom dispute between Hooke and Newton. And not just them, but I'm focusing on Hooke and Newton. In an unpublished letter intended for the president of the Royal Society at the time, Hooke chides Newton for having claimed that it was, quote, besides the business at hand to dispute about hypotheses in their debate. Hooke disagrees, citing the authority of Francis Bacon. Did I? No, that's coming up. I didn't put everything on the slide. Sorry about that. Well, I don't know why I didn't. In any case, this is a short quote from Hook. He says, unlike Newton, I judge that there is nothing that conduces so much to the advancement of philosophy as the examining of hypotheses by experiments and the inquiry into experiments by hypotheses. And I have the authority of the incomparable Verulam to warrant me, cites Bacon. When someone cites Bacon in this period, you know, you, you know that this is something you should pay attention to. Whereas Newton insists that he must remain neutral on various hypotheses concerning the nature of light, so he says, Hooke places the assessment of hypotheses through experiments at the very center of his methodology. Hooke and Newton each conducted fundamentally important experiments in optics in this era, but they embraced fundamentally opposed methodologies for the study of light. And that was not all. So, the next quote, just to show you that Hooke was not idiosyncratic, in some ways is even more stark. And here's where I might have something new to add um, to this uh, long known issue about hypotheses. This is from a short paper published in the Philosophical Transactions by Christian Huygens, probably the leading mathematical thinker in Europe at this time, um, and someone who Newton had a great deal of respect for. So, uh, I'm really just talking about sort of the superstars of the error. Here is what Huygens says. For my part, I believe in an hypothesis that should explain mechanically, very important, and by the nature of motion, the colors yellow and blue would be sufficient for all the rest, in regard that those others, being only more deeply charged, as appears by the prisms of Mr. Hooke, do produce the dark or deep red and blue. Okay, neither do I see why Mr. Newton doth not content himself with the two colors, yellow and blue, for it will be much more easy to find an hypothesis by motion that may explicate these two differences than for so many diversities as there are of other colors. Until he hath found this hypothesis, hypothesis he hath not taught us, this is a translation from Latin, from, so this is how they translate into contemporary English at that time, what it is wherein consists the nature and difference of colors, but only this accident, which certainly is very considerable, of their different refrangibility. Huygens, I claim, is uninterested in Newton's experimental results per se. He wishes to see them folded into a theory or hypothesis that provides a mechanical explanation of what colors are. Contending that colors or colored rays compose ordinary sunlight does not explain what colors really are. For that, we require a conception of matter and motion. And we presumably need to think of them as caused somehow, as sensations caused somehow through a wave traveling through a medium or by particles interacting with a perceiving subject. For Huygens, Newton's task as a philosopher studying light is to explain the nature of colors, a task that philosophers had readily tackled since antiquity. But Newton tries to avoid that task altogether. He presents experimental results, as we saw very briefly, without ever saying what colors really are in a mechanical way. Okay, I think Huygens's, that's hard to say, Huygens's brief criticism of Newton is illustrative of a broader theme that marked Newton's long career. And this is a theme that will tie together my first case study in optics and my second case study, which happens to occur at the end of uh, Newton's life, his debate with Leibniz namely his relationship with the emerging consensus among natural philosophers that mechanical explanations of phenomena in the world are the gold standard. And as I will say, 
uh, later on, if there was any candidate for what Kuhn would call a paradigm of natural philosophy between 1672 and 1716, the death of Leibniz when Newton was toward the end of his career, it would be the mechanical philosophy. Uh, as we will see, however, Newton's relationship with that orientation toward understanding natural phenomena was extremely vexed. Okay. Newton confirmed the suspicions of Hooke and Huygens, I think, um, in a letter that he wrote to Oldenburg in June of 1672. And I'm sorry for going on at such length, but I do want to show why I think um, Newton's relationship to the mechanical philosophy is so crucial even in 1672, long before he had his theory of gravity where it was very much uh, important. Here's what Newton said. But I knew that the properties which I declared of light were in some measure capable of being explicated not only by that, his corporeal view, but by many other mechanical hypotheses. And therefore I chose to decline them all and speak of light in general terms, considering it abstractedly as something or other propagated every way in straight lines from luminous bodies without determining what that thing is, whether a confused mixture of difform qualities or modes of bodies or of bodies themselves or of any virtues, power, or beings whatsoever. He will say something very similar in Principia Mathematica about force. Amazingly similar, actually, and it really hit me the other day because I did prepare for this talk. Uh, how similar it is, and that was uh, something that he didn't write for many, many years, 15 years or so. Okay. For the same reason, I chose to speak of colors according to the information of our senses as if they were qualities of light without us, whereas by that hypothesis I must have, um, hooks, I must have considered them rather as modes of sensation excited in the mind by various motions, figures, or sizes of the corpuscles of light making various mechanical impressions on the organs of sense. From Newton's perspective, both the wave and the particle understandings of light within optics are mechanical hypotheses. And so they are precisely the kinds of hypotheses on which he wants to remain neutral. He brackets them, and he doesn't want to presuppose that sunlight consists of red and blue rays in the precise sense that it causes sensations in us. That would be to explain the nature of colors. Okay? And as we have seen, Huygens says, well, you have found this accident of light, a feature of light, but the point of optics is to explain it. The point, according to Huygens, is to give an explanation of what colors really are. And that, for those of you, how many people have taken a history of philosophy course that dealt with 1600 to 1800? Nobody! Unbelievable. Okay. We might be here for a long time then. I'm going to have to give you a couple hours of lecture on that. Uh, unbelievable. Well, um, you can take it from me that one of the big issues, and, and please nod philosophers in the audience, uh, between 1650 and 1750 was exactly what we call a distinction between primary and secondary qualities, explaining the features of the world, like red shirts and certain smells and sounds and so on, in terms of an austere mechanist view according to which what really exists in the world are particles, corpuscles, atoms, divisible things, consisting of size, shape, and motion, basically, that hit our senses and cause us to have all kinds of experiences of qualities, right? Huygens and Hooke think Newton is failing to give us what philosophy wants in optics, which is an explanation of what colors really are. And Newton doesn't, doesn't try and fail. He thinks that's not the point. The point of the work in optics is to run experiments and to come up with a doctrine that is supported by the experimental evidence with the prism, and to ignore exactly the thing that Hooke and Huygens think is the point of doing research in optics in the first place. So I take that to be a very fundamental um, debate, and I take it to turn in part on Newton's relationship to the mechanical philosophy. Namely, he is distancing himself from it, even at this very early age. He was quite young then. Okay. Case study number two. This will be shorter. Um, and it's, it's better known. Newton's debate with Hooke is well known, but Newton's debate with Leibniz is probably better known. 
Now, I want to try to go back to something I mentioned before from Kuhn, which is the idea that to have a scientific discipline, you need not just methodology, experimentation, observation, mathematics, all the things you might think, but a community of practitioners who engage in studying the world in a way that's predicated on their agreement about certain very fundamental methodologies and principles. And now I'm going to try to argue that this was missing, not only in the case of optics, where we saw the Huygens and Hooke dispute with Newton, but also in the case of the theory of gravity more generally, which, of course, is probably Newton's most famous contribution to the history of science, certainly one of them. OK. How much time do I have? I have no idea what time I started. Or I, I don't want to go too long. Does anyone know? 15 minutes. OK, perfect. OK. This is um, from Newton, Proposition 7, Book 3, one of the most astounding statements in the whole book from the point of view of people reading it at that time. Uh, gravity acts on all bodies universally, proportionally to the quantity of matter in each. Newton did not merely say uh, that the Earth and the Sun interact gravitationally, or a rock falling on the Earth interact gravitationally, but that it acts on all bodies in the entire universe, and indeed the parts of bodies. And this was a fantastically controversial idea during Newton's lifetime. Okay. Part of Newton's idea is to develop what he called a mathematical treatment of force. Now you might think, oh, well that means he's using uh, differential equations or some kind of very fancy geometrical technique, but actually that isn't what he meant. What he meant is, just like in the optics, he was going to treat the causes of changes of states of motion in an abstract fashion without considering any mechanical models that were extremely important to all the other natural philosophers working in his day. That is, if you recall your uh, Newton's three laws of motion, what he called an impressed force is understood and in fact defined as a cause of a change in a body's state of motion, right? It's what accelerates a body. We all learn this. But what's so revolutionary about the idea of a vis impressa or an impressed force is that he included what he called centripetal forces in the idea of an impressed force. So if you just limit yourself to percussion, impact, maybe you think, well, that's not really that exciting. So I impress a force on the body, but really it's just because I'm bumping into it that I can change. Well, apparently I can't change its state of motion. But anyway, some things <laughs> you can change their state of motion. Um, but he said that centripetal force was included. And so he immediately, even as a conceptual point, before any empirical research or observations was done, he included the idea that one body could change the state of motion of another body, even if they weren't located in the same place in the world. That's a conceptual point. He left that as a possibility. Okay? The definitions and the discussion of the laws enabled one to think that the Earth could change the state of motion of the moon okay, from a, a very great distance. Not an empirical claim that that's actually happening, but the notion of force enables us to think of it in that way. Okay? And that was a radical idea because he wasn't limiting himself as other philosophers like Descartes and Leibniz and Hobbes and so on were to cases of me mechanistic interaction. Causes needn't be mechanical in Newton's mathematical treatment of force. To make matters worse, he then, at the end of the book, concludes, in fact, not just as a conceptual possibility, but as an, as an actual fact, that gravity acts on all bodies universally. And so one of the great debates following Newton's Principia was whether he had postulated action at a distance. A very um, famous debate I'm not going to talk about here, actually, but which you can uh, look up. OK. How did Leibniz respond to these ideas. Uh, if, if you're interested, I'll just give you a snippet and then I'm going to give you a, real, a really great passage. Uh, two years after the Principia, Leibniz published an essay uh, on um, the causes of celestial motions in the Acta Eruditorum, important journal of the day, so February 1689. And Leibniz, having read the Principia, he was sent a copy 
by, directly by Newton, I believe. Correct? Anyone? Yes? Um, they had, had already corresponded with each other in 1676. Uh, Leibniz, having read about the mathematical treatment of force, having read about Newton's idea that we needn't tie causal interactions in nature to mechanistic um, processes, but can expand our notion of causation to include objects that are millions of miles apart, and think of them as causally interacting in some way, as he does here. Leibniz completely rejects these ideas. He doesn't uh, take them seriously for a moment. And in his essay, having read the Principia, he makes it very clear that there must be a mechanical interaction between the Earth and something like a fluid, a vortex, an ether, sort of in the tradition of the Cartesians, but in a much more sophisticated mathematical way, if you read the essay. He is not working in the same field, I claim, in, a, in an important sense, as Newton is. If you have any doubt about that, you can just wait till the end of Newton's life when Leibniz uh, began a correspondence with Samuel Clark, who was Newton's uh, parish priest at this time in London and who represented the Newtonians in probably the most important correspondence of the 18th century. I don't know if people have read the Leibniz-Clark correspondence. I highly recommend it. If you're going to read any philosophy, it's great stuff. It set the stage for everything that happened during the Enlightenment in terms of discussions of space, time, and motion. The way Leibniz did it is he sent letters to Princess Caroline of Wales, probably the most important or one of the most important intellectual political figures at the time, saying that things in England were uh, decaying, I believe is a fair translation. He used very strong words attacking Newtonian ideas. And one of the things he particularly wanted to call attention to is this idea of the Newtonian treatment of gravity. Here's what he says. I think this is my translation, but it's not controversial. Clark actually did a translation from the French after Leibniz died, and it's extremely uh, reliable in many ways. This is what Leibniz says. It is a strange fiction. Keep that in your mind, a fiction. He thinks Newton's idea is a fiction. To make all matter gravitate toward all other matter, as if, as if each body equally attracted every other body according to their masses and distances. That's the law of universal gravity. And this by an attraction properly so called, which is not derived from an occult impulse of bodies. Whereas the gravity of sensible bodies toward the center of the earth ought to be produced by the motion of some fluid. He wrote this at the end of his life, Leibniz did, in 1716. He still hasn't changed his mind from when he wrote the essay, The Tentamen, in 1689. And the case must be the same with other gravities, such as that of the planets toward the sun or toward each other. A body, here's the key, a body is never moved naturally except by another body which pushes it. After that, it continues until it is prevented by another body that touches it. Every other operation on bodies is either miraculous or imaginary. Many people now would regard Newton's discovery of the law of universal gravitation as one of the greatest achievements of the past 300 years of the history of science. But if you asked probably the leading mathematician in Europe in 1716, Leibniz, what he thought of the idea of universal gravity, this is what he would have told you. And he wasn't speaking metaphorically. He literally meant that Newtonian gravity would require the constant intervention of God into the ordinary affairs of nature. It requires a miracle. He wasn't arguing that Newton was just mistaken. He thought that Newton had invoked an imaginary physical interaction, one that cannot exist in the natural world. So take an analog from today. Suppose you had someone who claimed to be a biologist, and you were making a presentation uh, that invoked the DNA of some particular species of mouse. And suppose this person said, not, well, you know, I don't really think that you've got the genome of the mouse correct here, or I don't really think your genomic analysis explains the behavior of the mouse or its phenotypic characteristics. But suppose this person said, I don't believe in DNA at all. I don't think it exists. In fact, suppose the person said that DNA is miraculous or imaginary. It's not even a candidate for a possible cause of behavior or phenotypic characteristics. That's the analog to what Leibniz said in reply to Newton's greatest achievement in natural philosophy. He thought that it was imaginary, that it would involve a miracle 
OK. Now, in fact, if that's not enough, I don't know, do I have any more slides now? If that's not enough, in the Leibniz Clark correspondence, Leibniz actually makes, in a way, an even deeper objection to Newtonian natural philosophy, which some of you will be certainly very familiar with. Leibniz claimed that we could know, a priori, as we like to say now, post Kant, uh, that Newtonian natural philosophy, in particular its ideas about space, time, and motion, is absolutely mistaken on the basis of what, Le what Leibniz would consider to be the fundamental metaphysical principles that underlie all research into nature. In particular, he thought that Newtonian ideas about space, time, and motion violated what he called the principle of sufficient reason, sort of classic rationalist principle. Uh, it seems to me that, that this has been understated in its significance for us to understand whether they were engaged in a scientific um, community or not. If you are in a physics department today and you have a colleague who comes over and says, I heard your presentation on, I don't know, take your favorite physics uh, topic, uh, and I believe that you have violated a metaphysical principle then there is no amount of empirical reasoning, there's no amount of mathematics that can convince this person otherwise. You couldn't possibly be right. And if, it seems to me, uh, a physics colleague says that you have violated a metaphysical principle, then they're not doing physics. They're doing philosophy. And that's a segue into my conclusion. I'm, I'm at my conclusion, so don't worry. Um, here's the conclusion to this. Uh, argument. We've seen two case studies from the beginning of Newton's life and the end, and I think they have something in common, and I want to just tell you about that um, a little bit. Uh, as you probably know, people thought they were doing what they call natural philosophy um, in the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries. In fact, it went back much further than that. Newton was part of that tradition. The word philosophy is really important to my argument because it has always been the case. I think my philosophical colleagues will agree, that philosophy has been characterized by fundamental, deep, irresolvable disagreement. The inverse of scientific disciplines where there is deep agreement about basic methods, basic principles, observations, mathematics, etc. It seems to me, in fact, that um, one deep reason to think that Newton was a philosopher amongst philosophers is because philosophers have always had and continue to have fundamentally deep disagreements with one another. Uh, one way to put it is, from a Kuhnian point of view, philosophy has never been paradigmatic, unlike modern physics, modern chemistry, modern biology, and so on. In fact, I'll get back to a point I just made earlier and now make it in a sort of slightly more detailed way. If there was any candidate for a paradigm of natural philosophy between 1672 and 1716, the heyday of Newton's work, it was the mechanical philosophy. Every leading thinker in this period, including Robert Boyle in what he called chemistry, Robert Hooke in microscopy, optics, celestial mechanics, early geology, he was very um, um, prolific, Christian Huygens, Gottfried Leibniz in mathematics and the theory of motion, and John Locke, all of those people endorse the fundamental idea that natural phenomena should be explained in terms of matter and motion. This was sometimes called corpuscularianism, it was sometimes called the mechanical philosophy, it was sometimes just called the new philosophy. One reason it was so influential between 1672 and 1716 is that so many important philosophers before 1672 had articulated their support for the mechanical philosophy including Galileo in some respects in Italy, Merzen in France, Descartes in Holland, and Hobbes in England. It was an extremely influential uh, view by the time Newton was a young student in the 1660s at Trinity College. But as we have just seen, I think, both in optics and in um, the theory of planetary motion more generally, Newton did not accept the mechanical philosophy. He spent his whole career being criticized by people like Hooke, Huygens, and Leibniz precisely for deviating from the mechanical philosophy, from refusing to do what they thought a philosopher ought to do, which is give a mechanical explanation 
of things like colors, or things like planetary motion, or things like free fall. They thought the reason the new science, to use sort of our terminology, was so important is that it had overthrown the dominance of Aristotelian ideas. Of course, they were never scholars of Aristotle's ideas, and a lot of this was rhetorical um, hyperbole, but they thought that great progress had been made because there was an emerging consensus surrounding mechanical thinking in natural philosophy. But it was Isaac Newton, ironically, who deviated from that consensus. Okay. What can we conclude about this situation? Uh, well, I think there's uh, an irony here that is worth pointing out, and I'll conclude with that. Some of you may know that Isaac Newton was very well known for exhibiting a deep aversion to intellectual debate and controversy. There were many times in his life, beginning toward the very beginning of his intellectual career, when Newton said things like, I refuse to do any more philosophy because there's too much debate, there's too much controversy, there's too much disagreement, and I really can't stand it. He threatened many times to give up in philosophy altogether because of its constant debates and controversies, including the debate with Hooke, which started very early in his career. All the way through the end, he was having a deep controversy with Leibniz toward the end of his life. He never did give up on philosophy, but that was his deep feeling. So in fact, I think Newton sought an intellectual community of practitioners who would agree on fundamental ideas about mathematics, methodology, and philosophy. I think he wanted figures like Hooke, Huygens, and Leibniz to endorse his methods and ideas, but they never did. His approach to nature and his deviance from the me mechanistic consensus generated endless foundational debates throughout his life. So I will end with what I hope is a harmless anachronism. Newton wanted to be a scientist, but he was always a philosopher. Thank you. Is that okay? I don't know.